Welcome to Caserta's Data Intelligence Series. In this series, we talk about what it takes to go from a good data and analytics leader to a great one. We'll share with you the tools and methodologies you need to build better, faster, and more robust, as well as strategies and frameworks to generate more revenue and grow your business. Featuring some very special guests and experts to inspire you and give you advice and direction on your data journey. And now, introducing your host, Caserta Data and Analytics Evangelist and VP Marketing, Remy Rosenbaum. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about Data Vault, why this is great, why you should adopt it into your architecture, and some easy ways to do so. Uh, Data Vault is a great methodology or architecture for you to have clear auditability and data lineage into all of your data. And doing that is really important for business use cases, especially in financial services, healthcare, and other regulated industries. So how do we do this? Uh, to shed some light on it, I brought together two exceptional presenters who are going to tell you all about the ins and outs of how to unlock the potential of Data Vault. So first up, we're going to have Brett Burnham. Brett is a senior data architect with Caserta with more than 20 years of experience working with data to drive business value through the full life cycle of data movement, including data modeling and delivery. He has a passion for leading teams and architecting solutions that enable data-driven decision-making. Brett lives in the beautiful state of Virginia with his wife, three daughters, two dogs, a bird, and a fish. Uh, somehow they all live in harmony. And uh, next up, we have Daniel Block, who also lives in Virginia, but he doesn't have a fish. Uh, Daniel is a 20-year veteran of data architecture and engineering. His experience has spanned numerous industries and organizations of every size. Uh, recently, he has become an avid data vault practitioner um, and he lives with his wife, kids, and a dog. A little bit of housekeeping and then we're gonna get started. Uh, for those of you that don't already know, Caserta is a data and analytics professional services firm. We help leaders that understand the importance of becoming data-driven on their architectures, roadmaps, and uh, advanced implementations of those designs. Uh, of course, our first uh, call is always complimentary. And if we find a way forward to work together, then we'll gladly help you, and if not, we'd be happy to send you in the right direction. Um, you can reach me at remy at with any questions about how to get started. And speaking of questions, if you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them in the questions panel on the right, and we will get them answered by our excellent presenters. All right, Brett, the stage is all yours. Sure, thank you, Remy. And thank you for everyone who has uh, come to join us today. I can't tell you how excited Dale and I are to talk about our favorite subject, Data Vault. Let's just get to it. So what we have, Bank X. This is a story of a successful local bank that made it big. They made it big through their commitment to their customer and through strategic acquisitions. Now that kind of growth, that comes with challenges. Bank X's challenges are data challenges. Their data is siloed. Reporting and analytics were stitched together by heroes with spreadsheets. They lack a centralized integrated data store. Data insights are slow to come by, hard to repeat, and sometimes lack full acceptance. We're talking about trust in the data. Now the bank has recently brought on a handful of executives from larger financial institutions that are really accustomed to making data-driven decisions. The business is asking for, the business is demanding advanced analytics, real-time insights, self-service. Now, on top of all of this, Bank X just received formal notice from regulators specifically calling out their lack of data discipline. Bank X needs a data transformation. Bank X needs to unlock Data Vault. That's right, Brad. So when we arrived at the client in late October, um, the program already had some Q4 goals that included an EDW architecture, patterns, principles, and standards, as well as an actual functional EDW in their Q4 goals. And we were at late October already. So we had two months, including holidays. Um, so we dove in with Data Vault processes and principles. Um, their core banking system had about 300 objects that we needed to model and load. Um, but because of Data Vault principles and patterns, we were able to automate. Um, with scripts and other things and onboard 
any given object in about 15 minutes. So that includes everything, the model, the pipelines, the target tables, the scheduling that put the source object online and refreshing regularly, ready for consumption in the raw vault. So do the math, it took us about three weeks to ingest the entire core banking system and be ready for customers. And that was ingest into the raw vault. Uh, we'll talk about the data vault layers later. Uh, so our first customer was the loan department. So in preparation for our meeting with the loan department, um, we replicated their existing loan mark. It took us about three days and we used data vault um, patterns and principles. And it was, I think, two facts and probably about a dozen dimensions. And we virtualized these using views to, to simulate actual fact and dimension tables. Um, so our first meeting with the, with the loan department, uh, we were hit with dozens of changes, um, including every, adding time to several of the, the dimensions. So going from type one to type two, we were uh, asked to change the grain of one of the fact tables. And of course the proverbial add a column here, add a column there, add a column everywhere. Um, but because of the nature of data vault, all of our, our facts and dimensions were virtual. So adding a col column was a elementary exercise. So we were actually able to respond to these business changes in a matter of hours. So in one business day, we were complete with the changes and ready to um, meet with, a, with them again and present our changes. And we did, and the customer was delighted. And so the icing on the cake to this story is um, months later, uh, internal bank auditors showed up and they needed lineage as bank auditors normally do, but they didn't just need lineage, they needed lineage from two months ago. Um, and so what we were able to do because of data vault, because of the patterns and the metadata driven nature of the vault, Brett was able to write one query and cut and paste the results into a spreadsheet and email it to the auditors and we never heard from them again. So now let's talk about what data vault is. So organizations need to build and maintain data platforms, data warehouses, data marts, cubes, reports, star schemas, uh, we need to support APIs, we need to feed and care for data scientists and other data customers. And data vault is that supporting platform. It's that underlying layer um, that enables an organization to do all of these things. Um, another way I like to think of it uh, is, uh, is as a widget factory. So you go back to Econ 101, uh, organizations need to crank out high quality data widgets at scale uh, at, at low cost. And Data Vault is the widget factory that allows that to happen. Um, and as an added benefit, the widget factory itself, the Data Vault, is low cost, future proof, and easy to maintain and grow. All right. And so if the Data Vault produces data widgets, in this diagram, those widgets are consumed by the users in the section under the information delivery. Now this is a typical data platform diagram with sources on the left and data moving from the sources to the right to the users. But before we can deliver anything, any widgets to the business users, first we need to integrate Bank X's disparate source systems. And we do that by integrating business keys. Now what's a business key? It's whatever the business says, but think, really think enterprise, think enterprise entity concepts, like uh, examples include employee, account, customer. Now this integration is performed in a layer of the architecture called the raw data vault. Data vault is a multi-layered or multi-model architecture. We'll get more into that later. Now this raw data vault, the tables are structured using a hybrid modeling technique, where basically we're leveraging three main types of tables, hubs, links, satellites, more to come soon. Now this model, if based upon an enterprise lens, is a purely additive model, it does not de need to be refactored for changing business requirements or onboarding additional sources. That's powerful. Now this looks like a typical data platform architecture, but the differences lie in the data modeling technique, the data sourcing and the loading patterns, and most importantly, the business centric approach. Data Vault's big win. It can grow incrementally without incurring technical debt if modeled from the enterprise lens. So what we're saying is once you properly form the raw data vault, it's invulnerable to any changing of requirements or additional sources. It grows incrementally without incurring technical debt. Now that's the big win. Data Vault has a prime directive, auditability. You need to be able to load, you need to load the data exactly as they exist in the source system. 
And so this auditability is so key. I can think of an example, we were doing a data vault implementation at a healthcare payer and we got a call back where the historical reports were coming back inaccurate. Come to find out that the DBAs were manipulating the history tables in the source systems and Data Vault is able to pick this up. Data Vault don't, don't care. It's going to pick up all those changes. You're going to have that full fidelity of the history. You're going to know what happened and when. So what this ends up creating is our source of facts. You hear people talk about a source of truth. Now that's more for the traditional methods. But we found that truth is subjective, relative, and subject to change. And so what we want to have is a source of facts that we can base upon. And so we think of truth, we think of, you can think of perspectives. Uh, another example, we had a data vault implementation with a local government, and we had to get our heads around the source of facts, which is things like the HR data sets, employee, those are the facts. Now, how you want to see attrition, how you want to see headcount, that's, that's something that can have a different lens or different perspective based upon which lines of business are looking at those facts. I think Daniel has another good example of source of facts versus truth. Yeah, so one, uh, one analogy I like to share here is, is the, the difference between facts and truths is facts are the actual ones and zeros that the source system um, reported to us at a certain point in time. And truth, like, like Brett said, takes on multiple shapes depending on who the question asker is. Um, so the analogy I use is pretend in our source of facts, in our data, we say in product, we have, a, we have a jar and this jar holds eight ounces of water. And in another table in our source, we know that at a particular point in time, this jar, eight ounce jar had four ounces of water in it. Those are the facts. The optimism department is gonna see one, wanna see one truth and the pessimism department is going to see a different truth. And Data Vault puts us in a position to, with all the facts, present the truths based on different customer requirements. So at this point, we're going to transition to um, some of the core structures in Data Vault and get, get into some details. So as Brett mentioned, there are hubs, links, and satellites. These are the three core uh, table types in Data Vault in the raw Data Vault layer. And you can see here the hubs are kind of the, the nodes. They are the containers of the business concepts. The links are the tables that connect all the hubs and show us that you know, this account is related to this customer, this transaction is related to this product. And lastly, the, the satellite tables in Data Vault contain all the attribution for a particular link, for a particular relationship, or for a, a particular hub. And for uh, data professionals there, you'll see that hubs are very similar to a type one dimension without the attributes. Links are like factless facts, and, and satellites are very similar to a, a type two dimension. So with this, I think we're gonna walk through a, a kind of a visual example of how the bank grew. So how did we grow? We started with explicit business intent. So we started with a use case. And so working here once again from left to right source to the consumption on the right. In the middle we see we have our, our raw data vault. Those are our those icons you saw on the previous slide, the hubs, links, and satellites. So remember once those are properly formed, they don't have to be refactored. And so in this case, we started with the bank's core system to deliver the, the loan model. And once we did that, we started with the next use case. And we, like I said, we go with explicit business intent. So we only bring in the data that we need to fulfill that business use case. We don't want to, we want to avoid this big bang approach where it's nine months before you get any value. We don't, definitely don't want to build a field of dreams. We want to do this based upon explicit business use cases. After that, we delivered that low model we went through and we, in, we also added a source, that's the online banking for an API capability. And you see here, we're not refactoring the data vault, we're using the same data that's already in there and it's additive, we're adding the satellites based upon the new sources that we're ingesting. Then we go through and we added the card system. And once again, we're not refactoring the data vault, the data vault is growing like a graph database. In this case, we're, we added a star schema, um, a good old fashioned Ralph Kimball dimensional model for self-service. Finally, brought in the wealth management data and added a dashboard of all the integrated data off of that star schema model. So what we're seeing here is we're going from first use case all the way through, we're incrementally delivering business value without having to refactor, avoiding the big bang approach using those repeatable patterns. And this is the power of Data Vault. Now let's talk about the how of Data Vault. 
Right. So first and foremost, data vault is people and process. Um, as Brett mentioned, we're not going to build a field of dreams, build it, and the business will come. We need to be partners with the business in the building of the vault and the identifying of the core business concepts. Uh, other roles here, for example, obviously architects, data architects and engineers, the source system owners um, are definitely participating. And the most important process is agile. I can't see how data vault would perform well without agile, honestly. Um, blended teams starting small, proving value quickly is how um, data vault um, delivers value quickly. Other, other roles here could be, depending on your, on your ecosystem, you could have cloud architects and engineers, data stewards, uh, business analysts, data scientists, maybe some report and visualization specialists. Um, lots of roles could participate in the, in the building of the vault. Uh, but the important thing is that agile, iterative, start small, deliver value quickly. Data vault is also standards and technology. So as um, Brett has mentioned, we have all sorts of patterns and um, for data vault, they're modeling patterns, they're sourcing patterns, they're loading uh, data patterns, and of course, the ubiquitous presence of the business being use case driven, consumption driven, incremental delivery um, is key to, um, to everything in the, in the data vault. Um, so now let's talk physical. We're gonna look at some of the, the actual physical layers of data vault. And I wanna talk about this because there, there is some confusion about what data vault is and isn't. Um, and a lot of times when people are talking about what, what data vault is, they're talking about that layer in the middle, that raw data vault layer where the hubs, links, and satellites live. Um, but what we wanna specifically call out is data vault is, is a lot bigger than just the raw data vault layer. Um, it is each of these layers are built for purpose and optimized for that purpose. Um, and this is how data vault allows us to eat our cake and have it too, because we have the raw data vault, which is optimized for storage and integration with business concepts. And then you have the business vault, which is optimized for performance. And then the business layer on the far right is optimized for how we present data to the customer. So this is really a multi-model system. Um, again, li usually living in an RDBMS environment. Um, quick story about the, the power of the business layer. We were at this local government and they had decided to open up their ledger to citizens to see how money was coming in and going out. And so we had replicated the ledger in a couple of days and we're meeting with the business and um, they pulled up their report. We pulled up our report and we were hundreds of millions of dollars off um, between what they said we should have and what we actually had. My heart sank and I figured this was gonna be a long slog. So long story short, we dove into the details. Business spent about half an hour and they realized, oh wait, we forgot to tell you about this column and this new column and you need to filter on it. So we added that filter and it took just a matter of minutes because these were virtual um, reports in the business layer and we were able to check in, refresh our report, then we were only $10 million off. This happened three or four more times in the course of the afternoon where the business changed requirements on us by adding columns and adding filters. But because of the power of data vault, the power of these layers, we were able to implement these changes in minutes. And by the end of the day, by the end of this long four hour meeting, we were aligned. Our numbers matched their numbers and we were ready for the next level of UAT. So that is part of, of data vault and the power of using the layers um, and representing and virtualizing until it hurts, which is a data vault principle in, in the business layer. So now we wanna talk about how we build the data vault. This is really, really quick. And there's a two phase component to building your data vault model. The first is your enterprise data model. You start with your enterprise data model, enterprise data architects, your business is a partner here. And you figure what is that big picture data? What are the enterprise concepts in our business that inform our model? And this is what we call a top down approach. This enterprise model informs our hubs and our links. The next thing we do is we actually go to our source systems themselves. This is where the data lives and we do a bottom up design. And for the most part, this informs our satellites, also hubs and links, but that's, that's an edge case. And so this data vault um, model creation is both simultaneously a top down and a bottom up approach that really creates a robust model. Um, and as you can see, as, as Brett was transitioning the slides, it grows like a graph database as the hubs and links grow and the satellites grow. And so we want to review real quick, Data Vault Unlocked. We've talked about the what, the where, the why, and the how. Um, you can read this summary here, but the one thing I did wanna call out there on the bottom right around under how 
is work incrementally and horizontally. Absolutely imperative in data vault value delivery is that we take one particular use case, we start with the sources, we model them, uh, we implement them in the raw vault, we put them into the business layer and we get feedback quickly from the customer all the way from the left to the right, um, working incrementally and horizontally. So that's it. I think we have some time for questions. We went through that content pretty quickly. Um, Remy, back to you. What do you got for us? All right, guys, thank you. That presentation was excellent. And now we have time for a couple of questions. So I will check what we have. If we do not answer your question, uh, I will get back to you privately via email uh, with an answer from our stellar presenters. So first question, uh, we already have a mature architecture in place, but we're having problems. We have data silos and different facts across the org. Is Data Vault a right fit for us? Brett, you want to start with that one or? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So first of all, I will say Data Vault is not right for every situation. If you, if for example, if you don't care about necessarily having the full fidelity of history, if you don't necessarily need an enterprise lens or focus to your data integration environment, if you really, if you're just trying to maybe work on one business use case and that's as far as you're gonna go, Data Vault might not be right for you. Now, if you're in a highly regulated industry, if you need to integrate multiple uh, disparate source systems, if you are, need to understand and have that full data lineage, if you need to have the history, uh, the, if you need something that can deliver business value fast and grow incrementally, then that's where I would say Data Vault might be a good fit for your organization. Daniel, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think that was that was good. I would say you, you definitely need to start with a, a business champion. And if there is someone yeah. who is willing to um, invest in Data Vault, because there, there is a it's a new way of thinking about data and you don't want to do a Data Vault, like Brett said, if this is going to be a one off thing. Um, but if you're willing to commit to Data Vault as an architecture, as a philosophy, as a mindset, um, you have a business champion who's, who's uh, a partner in driving that, absolutely and go for it. Um, but again, Data Vault is really, it lives in the enterprise data warehouse space. It's not really a, a one-off technique if you just got to do this one thing for this one person this sure. one time. And uh, talking about the Data Vault philosophy, our next question is, uh, what are some tips on uh, getting started with Data Vault? Oh, I got that wins? one. Yeah, so find a business champion. Um, that is, and that is, that's really, I mean, it's, um, I'm repeating myself, but that is the most important thing because that gives you the, the influence across the organization to be able to deliver value. And really it's, it's also, you talked about the silos, is getting those silo owners on board. Um, that's, that's really where you start is once you, once you get the people on board, once you adopt kind of the new philosophy, the new way of thinking, um, the, the process agile is pretty ubiquitous these days and the technology is, is not really that hard. The hard part is, is getting the people on board with a new way of thinking, a new way of doing things. That, that will pay off definitely in the long run. Yeah, I would also add, I would seek help. It's, it's not something to get into on your own. There are um, well-defined standards that are published out there and I recommend following them to a T. Don't try to recreate the wheel. Don't try to customize, follow the standards and find people who have done this before. Yeah, rookie mistakes are common in data vault implementations. Honestly, be careful. Do you wanna just throw out one example of a rookie mistake you could think of, which is just one pitfall to avoid? Uh, yeah, any, so like Brett mentioned, there are all of these standards that have been kind of developed by the data vault community over the last 10 or 20 years. And they were, they're tried and true tested in the field. You know, these aren't academic concepts that were dreamed up in an ivory tower. Um, and so really any of the, anytime you look at a data vault standard, there's this, the natural reaction is, well, we haven't never done it that way. We haven't had to do it that way before. So we could just throw that one out. And you kind of have this buffet attitude towards the data vault approach um, and data vault ecosystem. And it doesn't work. I mean, the analogy I use sometimes is, is data vault is like a finely tuned mechanical watch. You can't just take a certain gear and say, I, I don't like that gear. That gear doesn't work in our organization and throw it out. Your watch isn't going to work. So really you've got to embrace the full 
philosophy and architecture ecosystem that is Data Vault to, to be successful and be very careful to, to not cherry pick um, standards because it doesn't work. All right, that's excellent. And um, our last question. And for all of those of you who we didn't answer the questions, we will get back to you via email. Uh, the last question, do you design custom architectures with Data Vault? What would the process look like? Uh, I think they're assuming Caserta in general, or you oh. specifically, or both. Yeah, so I would say um, the architecture has to be custom. Um, there's, there are data warehouse products out there, but given the nature of um, data warehousing, these data ecosystems, um, e there's nothing that you can buy that is gonna be exactly right for your organization. So definitely that's what we do is custom architectures, sort of that we've been doing this for years and uh, Data Vault is a part of that. So yeah, give us a call. Yep, that's All right. right. That's all the time we have for today. Brett, Daniel, that was excellent. Thank you for unlocking the insights of Data Vault. And uh, everyone else, stay tuned for the next episode in the Caserta Data Intelligence Webinar Series. Thanks.